All right. Well, we're going to uh, have another little time in the Word. Are you being deceived by doctrines of demons? I hope not. Or do you believe and know the truth? <clears throat> First Timothy 4, we'll be looking at that a little bit. Uh, it was interesting the day that I was actually working on exegeting this portion of Scripture. I got a phone call from a lady who told me that her friend... I wanted her to call me to get my biblical advice because she told me the Lord actually told her uh, to go off sugar and gluten and coffee. And the Lord told her to only eat fruits and vegetables and fast. And uh, she went on, we talked for about an hour on the phone, and she said, you know, my friend encouraged me to call you to get some biblical counseling because uh, she was concerned that I might have been uh, buying into a doctrine of a demon. And uh, so I tried to share with her from scripture, and one of the passages I used was the one we're going to cover tonight. And I'm sure it wasn't by chance <laughs> that she called me on the very day I was studying this passage. So my question as we start our time uh, in this second session is what does the scripture say regarding these issues? Does God want us to go off gluten? Does he want us to give up our coffee? I went to a church one time, uh, it was a very legalistic church and I was dating my husband. He said, you got to go to this church, it's a circus. And it was a circus. <laughs> They had uh, invitations for the men to come down and get their hair cut and the women to get their dresses lengthened. And one of the things the pastor did, he sold coffee cups in his bookstore so that when you finished your cup of coffee, you saw his face at the bottom because he believed it was a sin to drink coffee. So he wanted you to see his face and be reminded that you were sinning by drinking coffee. So... Uh, you know, there's, lady, there's a lot of weird ideas out there about what we eat and what we drink. But what does the Bible really say about these issues about food and diet and things like that? Well, let's look what Paul has to say through the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter 4, verse 1 of 1 Timothy. Now the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter time, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God has created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is to be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So let's look at two causes of apostasy, two characteristics of apostates, two creeds of apostates, two commands regarding what God created. Now, again, I don't like to jump into the middle of a portion of a book, but just right above that, chapter 3, verse 16, Paul has just told his son Timothy about six non-negotiables of our faith. Uh, and you can look at that, verse 16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the nations, believed on the world, and received up into glory. And so the transition is easy to see. There are some that are in the flock that don't hold to the six non-negotiables of our faith. And so Paul begins to write again about some who have left the faith and they're teaching doctrines of demons. And so he begins with the word now, which is actually better translated in the Greek, but it's a contrast. In contrast to those who hold to the six non-negotiables of the faith, but now we have those that are denying the faith and speaking about doctrines of demons. There are obviously those who do not hold to the faith. And he goes on to say, the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter times. Some will depart from the faith. So we need to ask the question, when did the Spirit say this? When did the Spirit tell Paul that some were going to depart from the faith? Well, it could actually be when, when Paul said goodbye to the, remember he's writing to the church at Ephesus and he's telling the, uh, the elders at Ephesus goodbye. And he's saying, I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves are going to uh, come in among you. Some of your own selves, men on the elder board are going to rise and draw away disciples after them. In other words, men on the elder board are going to fall into doctrines of demons and they're going to uh, 
coal men after them. And he said, remember, I warned you about this for three and a half years with tears. And so Paul knew somehow the spirit told him that some were going to depart from the faith. Or he could be talking about what, what Jesus himself predicted in Mark. False Christ, false prophets are going to rise and if possible, deceive the very elect. Whichever it is, I don't know which one it is, but we do know the Holy Spirit said this. And he said it expressly, which means it was outspoken, it was openly. So it could have been through our Lord or it could have been what Paul was told in Acts chapter 20. So what did the Spirit say? The Spirit said in the latter times, some are going to depart from the faith. What are the latter times? What's he talking about? Well, we know we're living in the last days, but the last days really started with the ascension of Christ into heaven. That begins the last days, and the last days will end when the Lord returns. Hallelujah. Even so come Lord Jesus. And uh, we know that Paul says, <clears throat> before that time, there'll be a great falling away from the church. Um, so here in 1 Timothy, though, Paul speaks of some who depart from the faith. Uh, he's already mentioned Hymenaeus and Alexander, but here are some, and they could be others, that will depart, they desert, they abandon, they withdraw from the faith. They willfully abandon the faith they claim to have had. And as sad as that is, it does happen. And it happens a lot, not just in Paul's day, but in our day. It happens a lot that people that once held very dear to the tenets, the six non-negotiables of the faith, they throw them out and they leave the faith. Uh, in 1 Timothy, Paul adds two reasons why they depart from the faith. Not only were they never in the faith, but notice what he says. They give heed to deceiving spirits, and number two, they give heed to doctrines of demons. Now, what does it mean to give heed to deceiving spirits? Well, the giving heed here means to cling to them. And the word deceive means to wander. And it comes from the English word planet. And as you know, uh, our planets, they seem to wander. You know, you can be looking at the moon, all of a sudden it's over here. And, or you can be looking at the little dipper and the big dipper. And all of a sudden that it feels like they're, they're moving, they're wandering. And deceiving spirits would be spirits which cause people to wander wander from the truth and then they cling to what is false. And ladies, deceiving spirits are not of the Holy Spirit because Jesus is very, very clear in the upper room that the Holy Spirit leads us what? Into all truth. The Holy Spirit leads us into the truth. Deceiving spirits lead us into false teaching. And so ladies, this would be anything that seduces, misleads you. Uh, it's an imposter. It's a fraud. Uh, one man said, deception has her spirits of every kind, which she employs to darken the hearts and destroy the souls of men. Now, ladies, this would include all false teachers and all false teaching. This would include anything that doesn't match up to the truth of God's word. Remember that was Eve's problem. <laughs> We studied her last year when I was here. Remember the seduced sister, has God said? God didn't really say that. No, he didn't say that. Yes, he did. And ladies, there are well-meaning people. You probably have some well-meaning friends that are trying to seduce you with doctrines of demons. God didn't really say that. I mean, you can kind of twist scripture a little bit. That, that was for that age. That was cultural. That's not really for you, Right? Ladies, we must for not one moment listen to Satan. Don't even listen to your well-meaning friends that try to convince you otherwise. Uh, we do have a wonderful promise in 1 John that believers will not be led away by false teachers. We will overcome them. Praise God for that. Well, Paul mentions another cause of apostasy, and notice what he says, giving heed to doctrines of demons. Now, what are doctrines of demons? This would be anything that is energized by Satan. Ladies, anything that is not of the Holy Spirit is of another spirit. It's of Satan. And under this would fall all kinds of cults. Uh, I could mention the prosperity gospel, mysticism, salvation by works, new age teaching, devil worship, the NAR movement. I mean, there's 4,000 cults right now. So I can't mention four. I mean, that would take the rest of the time to mention 4,000 cults that are in our world today. 
So any of those things would fall under this category. Uh, some of them we're familiar with, some were not. And you might say, well, that's really awful, Susan. I wouldn't be led away by mysticism, by the prosperity gospel, by the NAR, by Mormonism, Muslim. I wouldn't be led away by all that. That's really awful. It is, but when we get into verse 3, I'm afraid we all are going to be pricked in our conscience, as I'm afraid many of us have bought into seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. But before we look at verse 3, let's look at verse 2 and notice the two characteristics of apostates. They speak lies and hypocrisy, and their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Now, before we look at the first characteristic of an apostate, notice in verse 1, we saw the Holy Spirit speaks, but here in verse 2, who's speaking? False spirits are speaking. And what are they speaking? They're speaking lies. <laughs> the Holy Spirit speaks truth. False spirits speak lies. Ladies, this is the first characteristic of apostates. They speak lies in hypocrisy. What does this mean? They're liars. They're hypocrites. They're actors in a play. The things they say and do have nothing to do with truth, but have everything to do with lies. Now the question comes up, do they know they're lying? Do false teachers know they're lying? I believe some do. I believe a lot of them know exactly what they're doing. They have one goal. That's it. Money. They know they're speaking lies. However, I do believe some, their consciences are so seared. They've seared them with a hot iron that they honestly don't even know they're lying. They lie so much they don't even know they're lying. Now ladies, that's a scary place to be, isn't it? To not even know, you've desensitized your conscience, you don't even know you're lying. I've met people like that and you can't trust anything they say or do. Their lives are a sham. And everyone around it, around them knows that except for them. <laughs> they all know it. These people teach doctrines that are made up in their own mind to their own liking and not the doctrines of the word of God. Remember the prophets in 1 Kings? It was said that the Lord put a lying spirit in their mouth. That's kind of creepy, isn't it? The Lord put a lying spirit in their mouth of all the false teachers. And so maybe the Lord's just given them over and just puts a lying spirit in their mouth. Well, Paul then mentions the second characteristic of apostates. He says their conscience is seared with the hot iron. There seems to be a progression here from the habitual lying. And ladies, that's why it's so, it's so concerning it to us. It behooves us to not lie. Because once you start that habit of lying, you can just keep lying, keep lying to the point that your conscience becomes seared. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. All who love and make a lie will spend eternity in hell. And so we have to be very careful because if you do that, you can keep lying and lying and lying to the point that you don't even realize you're lying anymore. You have a seared conscience. Turn over to Romans chapter 1. Probably most of you could quote this, but Paul reiterates this truth here in Romans 1 verse 24. Therefore God gave them up to uncleanness and the lefts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. For a lie and worship and serve the creature more, creator, more, create creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Now notice what it says. For this reason, somebody's alarm's going off, God gave them up your, to vile passions. Even their women exchanged the natural use for that which is against nature. Likewise, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving themselves the penalty of the error which was due. And yet they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That is scary. To do those things which are not fitting being filled, and it goes on, all this unrighteousness, sexual normality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, wickedness, and on and on, this whole list, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and on the list goes. Ladies, did you notice that Paul says here in the Romans passage, they exchange the truth of God for a lie? For lies. They left the truth, and they embraced and clung to lies to lies. 
And so for this reason, God gives them over to a seared conscience, a reprobate mind. Now, what does it mean, not only here in Romans, but also back to 1 Timothy, what does it mean to have a conscience that is seared with a hot iron? Well, the conscience is seared, which means it's cauterized, it's rigid, it's hard, it's insensitive. In fact, in biblical times, they would mark those who had committed crimes so that they could bear the stigma of what they had done. So it is with those caught up in doctrines of demons. They bear their hypocrisy and others can see what they have done or what they are doing. They bear the marks of their hypocrisy like a garment bears the permanent marks of an iron that's too hot. Have you ever done that? (laughs) I have. I've ruined many garments. By getting in, I've learned now to test it. But I used to iron my clothes while they were on me, and I used to have burns here. My husband would go, why do you iron your clothes on your body? I said, well, honey, it takes less time. You know, you just get the iron out and start ironing, you know. And he goes, Susan, you got marks all over your neck. And I go, well, you know, just cover a little makeup or something. But I, I really used to do that. And then finally I thought, you know, maybe I should stop ironing my clothes on my body. So... But, you know, even when I do get the ironing bore out and iron my clothes, I, you know, usually I test the iron out because I have ruined some very pretty garments by, like, you know, leaving it too long. Oh, it looks, yeah. You get too hot, and the next thing you know, you have a beautiful garment that is not repairable or wearable. That's what he's saying. They're seared with a hot iron. Also, in biblical times, they would use a branding iron for their livestock to indicate ownership Just like we have cattle that are branded in our nation by farmers, which indicate what? Ownership. Likewise, those who have their conscience seared with a hot iron are the property of seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Ladies, that's frightening. That's frightening. To think of your conscience being so seared that you can't understand things, you can't reason things, you've been given over to a reprobate mind, But what's more frightening is in the next verse, which should shake all of us up. What do these apostates teach? Surely it must be something like dishonor your parents, burn your children at the stake, worship demons, denial of the virgin birth, denial of Jesus being the son of God. I mean, some horrendous thing like that. Those are doctrines of demons, but they're not as subtle as the two he mentions in verse 3. The two creeds of apostates. And isn't that what Paul just said? They're seducing spirits. They're not just out there like the normal stuff. They, they come in very subtly and creep into the church. Lady Satan comes as an angel of light. He looks just like the real thing. And don't be surprised at this, right? He's an angel of light. And so he comes in to to be subtle and to be seducing in how he trips the church and how he trips up the sheep. So here they are. Verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from food. Now, these two specific doctrines, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from food, stem from the heresy that went on in the biblical world, but it also goes on in our world, which is Gnosticism. And I don't have time to get into everything about Gnosticism, but I know many of you are well taught. Uh, You're in good Bible churches. You've heard the, the heresy of Gnosticism. But, you know, they were involved in legalism, mysticism, astrology, angel worship, asceticism, in other words, uh, extreme denial of their bodies. They, they trained themselves. They would beat their bodies into subjection. And so because of it, it, this, it fleshed out in such acts as abstaining from marriage, very strict dietary rules. Uh, Some people accepted marriage as necessary to preserve the race, but others regarded it as evil, and so they wouldn't uh, have children. They would adopt children. And so their beliefs were just strange. If you don't know anything about Gnosticism, you should spend some time uh, looking at it. But they didn't believe they thought the body was evil, and so really you weren't responsible for what you did in your body. You could fornicate, you could kill, you could do whatever you want to, but you weren't responsible for the deeds done in your body because your body is matter and it's evil. And so they didn't drink wine, they didn't eat uh, meat, they lived on bread and vegetables pretty much, and they condemned any natural cravings. And even some denied marriage. Now, having said all that, which is what probably Paul is condemning here, Paul mentions the first condemning doctrine 
that these apostates taught was forbidding to marry. The forbidding here means to prevent or hinder. In our day, most of you would probably say, well, oh, that's the Roman Catholic Church because priests don't marry, right? So we're forbidding people to marry. But ladies, it seems to be a much broader category than that. It's true that forbidding to marry could be interpreted as commanding to be celibate. However, since the word forbid means to hinder or prevent someone from getting married, we can broaden this in our age to what has become the norm, even among Christians. Even among Christians. I remember one time a lady told me that God told her to live with some guy. And I was like, not the God of the Bible. (laughs) He didn't tell you that. But that's what she told me. I'm appalled. I don't know about you. I'm appalled with the number of believers that I've heard about that are living together. They are not married. They're living in fornication. And they're endorsing others who do that. In fact, this is shocking. A study from the National Marriage Project found that more and more young adults today are delaying marriage because they see it as a capstone that comes after achieving one's life goals. And younger generations aren't even getting married at all. They're staying single. Now, this... this statistic will shock you. According to the U.S. Census, the number of couples aged 50 and over who simply live together but are not married rose from 2.8 million in 2010 to 17 million in 2019. There are 17, probably more of that because that was two years, well that's three years ago now, 17 million Americans 50 and over are simply living together. They're not getting married. Now, you want to hear their 10 valid reasons why you should remain unhitched? (laughs) Here they are. It says that you could be better off financially, mentally, and even physically. Number one, most people aren't in a hurry to get married anymore. Number two, many people feel there aren't any advantages to being married. Number three, for men, being married could be connected to being overweight. What? (laughs) Number four, marriage can present a slew of financial problems. Number five, marriage can seem like an outdated institution, and some people just don't want to fit into that mold. Number six, getting married puts your friendships at risk. Number seven, marriage can lead to the risky habit of relying on one individual for every emotional need. I remember when I got married, my husband said, Susan, God didn't make me to meet all your emotional needs, so don't expect me to. I'm like, really? I thought he did. So, and then I started crying because like, I thought that's why you got married so you could. <laughs> Number eight, these days a happy marriage requires a serious commitment of time and energy that can, can be hard to maintain. And number nine, as dim as it sounds, plenty of marriages in this country end up in divorce anyway. And the 10th reason you shouldn't get married, there's a good alternative to marriage. It's called a civil union or a domestic partnership. There you go. Ladies, encouraging others to not get married when marriage is a God-ordained institution is blasphemous. It's blasphemous. Paul even says in this epistle about the young widows, he said, therefore I desire the young widows. They marry, bear children, rule the house, give no occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. Why? Because if not, some are already turned aside to Satan. Here they go. They're turned aside to Satan. They're wandering from house to house speaking about things they shouldn't talk about. We are to get married. Paul says marriage is honorable in the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. I feel bad for those 20, 17 million Americans. God will judge. Jesus himself said, have you not read he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this cause a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife and the two are one flesh. What God has joined together Let no one separate. And before we go on, I will say, and I will say it publicly, marriage is between a man and a woman. (laughs) Let me say that again. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Not a woman and a woman, not a man and a man, not a transgender and a dog, or not, you know. Years ago, there was a woman in Houston. I don't know if you read this. She She couldn't find anyone to marry her, so she married herself. And her mother performed the ceremony. She married herself. And my husband said, what's she going to do when she wants to get a divorce? She got a divorce. I divorce myself. Well, what do you, how do you do that? Wow. Marriage is between a man and a woman. No abominable combination, a man and a woman. 
Now, the second thing apostates command is to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving. Again, you know the Jewish laws. They were forbidden in Old Testament times to not eat certain things according to the Mosaic law. But remember uh, in Acts chapter 10, remember when Peter was in the upper part of the house and he fell asleep and he saw a great vision, you know, fork foot of beasts and creeping things coming down. And Peter, God said, Peter, arise and eat. He said, not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And God said, don't call anything unclean <laughs> that God has called clean. And so that was the whole idea. You know, not only take the gospel to the Gentiles, but everything that God has created was clean. It was good. In fact, in Romans 14, those who have trouble with this, Paul calls them weak Christians. They're weak Christians. Those who can't eat these things to the glory of God. The word weak means someone who is weak in their conscience and they need to educate their conscience. My husband used to tell me that all the time, Susan, educate your conscience by scripture. <laughs> educate it. The writer to the Hebrews says this, don't be carried about with various and strange doctrines for it is good that the heart be established with grace, not with food, which has not profited those who are preoccupied with it. Ladies, we are in an age that is preoccupied with diets and foods and ridiculousness. These preoccupations we have with diets and food and what to eat and what not to eat can lead us to what Paul says are various and strange doctrines seduced by a demon. This is serious. And ladies, we should examine ourselves in this area. Paul says, don't forbid marriage. Don't forbid certain food. Why? Notice what he says. Everything is good if it is received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Marriage is good. Food is good. If you receive it with a thankful heart and you believe and know the truth. Ladies, this is kind of scary because it indicates, again, those who are teaching this stuff, they don't believe and they don't know the truth they're lost. Those who are in the truth know that food and marriage are created by God and they're thankful for both, right? Again, we have knowing the truth, which is opposite of those who are speaking lies in verse two. Well, Paul repeats himself in verse four. So this must have been a big issue because anything that is repeated in the Bible is there for emphasis. So when you have something that's repeated, it's giving emphasis to it. So now he gives two certainties about what God's created in verse 4. Notice what he says. For every creature of God is good. Every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Ladies, this is an interesting statement in light of what we read in Romans 1. Because in Romans 1, it says they were what? Unthankful. But here, those who don't have a reprobate mind, they're, they're thankful, right? They're thankful for what they had. God's children know better. They're thankful for what God gives them, whether it's marriage, food, or any other good thing. They're thankful. And Paul says every creature of God is good. Now, ladies, notice he doesn't say everything is good, but everything God created and made is good. Food and marriage. In fact, I want you to turn back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. It's very fascinating because Paul's probably picking up from these verses in Genesis chapter 1. Food and marriage. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed him and said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the bird of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. God said, See? I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is in the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. And God saw everything he made. Indeed, it was what? Very good. What did Paul just say? Everything God created, verse 4, is what? Good. Good. God saw everything he'd made, male and female, there's the marriage. And then what was the second thing? Food. <laughs> yeah. And it's very good, right? Marriage is good. I was married six days shy of 46 years. Uh, my husband used to say, yeah, th three years, we're good. No, he was just teasing, but he was a, <clears throat> he was a jokester. But uh, 
you know, 46 years of marriage, good, right? Well, not that it wasn't difficult at times, but it was good, right? And food, I love to eat, so it's good. It's all good. <laughs> it's very good, right? Well, Paul gives two commands, two charges regarding what he's created. The first charge is don't refuse it. Don't refuse it. This means nothing, not one thing that God has created is to be rejected or thrown away. Marriage or food. I don't think it means to throw out leftovers, you know. <laughs> I like to keep them. However, I think I'm battling from something I ate. I think it's been in my freezer way before my husband passed away. So I was home, happened to be home this last week, and I decided to pull out and eat some of it. And ever since then, it's like, hmm, I don't think that settled well. I don't know how long that leftover's been in there. So you might want to, you know, eat, not eat them if they're smelling a little weird. So, <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> secondly, Paul says you receive what God has created with thanksgiving. In other words, what's he saying? Be thankful for your marriage. Be thankful for marriage. Be thankful for food. Genuine believers who believe and know the truth know that food and marriage are created by God and therefore we give humble thanks for both. Paul, Paul goes on to say, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Food and marriage are pure and holy, which is what sanctified means. Ladies, we who know God recognize the truth. We're not like those who are seduced into forbidding marriage and forbidding food, which God has created for us to be received with thanksgiving. It's sanctified by the word of God. The word which God said in Genesis 1, it's good. Marriage is good. Food is good. Ladies, this is God's word. We don't mess with it. <laughs> this is God's word. He says marriage is good. He says everything he's created for us to eat is good. <clears throat> Ladies, God's creation is not only sanctified by his word, but also by prayer, which means the recipients of these two graces, food and marriage, receive these things with gratitude. We give thanks. As Paul says, whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink what? Do all to the glory of God. These are good things. These are good things. In fact, the word here would, the word encompass eat, excuse me, this would include, include eating, drinking, marriage, and a myriad of other things. Marriage and food are a blessing and they're sanctioned by God. One man says this, those who thank not God for their food and pray not for his blessing in the use of it, are unworthy even of a morsel of bread and of the breath they breathe. And I would add this, those who do not thank God for their marriage and don't pray for his blessing on it are unworthy of it. Ladies, this should challenge us. Do you thank the Lord every time you eat a bite of food? <laughs> and train your children to be thankful for the food they eat along with everything that God gives them. This should challenge us to be more thankful for our marriage. Train our children and our grandchildren. Marriage is good. Marriage is good. It's not something to be avoided, as seen in our day by the 17 million and probably more by now that are not getting married. So what are the two causes of apostasy? They're giving heed to deceiving spirits and giving heed to doctrines of demons. Are you guilty of listening to teachers and teaching that, you know, might be just a little off, but you find it enticing? Do you read things that tickle your ears, but don't challenge you spiritually? Is the word of God more important to you than food or money? Do you cling to godly teaching or are you growing in your knowledge of God? Secondly, two characteristics of apostates. They speak lies and hypocrisy, and they have a seared conscience. Are you in the habit of examining your words to make sure you're speaking truth and not half lies or flattery? Do you think white lies are okay? When you sin, are you convicted of it by the Holy Spirit? Or have you minimized sin and rarely find yourself confessing or repenting of your sin? Is it possible you've quenched or grieved the Spirit of God and that your conscience is on the brink of being seared with a hot iron? The two creeds of apostates, they forbid marriage and they forbid certain foods. Do you believe marriage is good? Have you been accepting the new norm in our day which says living together is okay and same-sex marriage is acceptable? 
Do you confront Christians who you know are fornicating or have un uh, ungodly ideas about marriage? And what about your diet, the things you eat? Do you make those spiritual issues? Do you think your way of eating is the only way? Do you judge others in your heart because they are not convinced that your way of eating is the right and only way to eat? I know Christians who make it an issue. It's not right. Do you try and push your way of eating on others to the point of being offensive? Now, ladies, obviously, if we eat too much of the wrong thing, it's not so great, right? You know, um, you know, you don't want to eat the whole pan of brownie, but half a pan's okay. <laughs> but, um, amen. Yeah, amen, yes. <laughs> but what we have to do is be careful about making these things an idol. Do not make these things an idol. Don't impose your dietary restrictions on other. I know some people have to, have to go off gluten for certain dietary things. I'm not, I'm not saying that's wrong. But don't make your eating habits a spiritual issue. Keep in mind a healthy doctrine is a far more eternal value than healthy food. And then the two commands regarding what God created. They're to, we are to refuse it not and to receive it with thanksgiving. Are you refusing to educate your conscience about what God says regarding food and marriage? Are you willing to study the word of God so that you will be able to rightly divide the word of truth, especially the truth about what God's created? Do you thank God for the food you eat? And are you training your children to be grateful for the food they receive? Do you complain when you don't get to eat the things you like to eat? And do you allow your children to whine about the food they eat? Do you thank God for your marriage and the marriage of others? Are you praying against the attacks of the evil one who would like nothing better than to destroy your marriage? The marriage that God instituted? Well, these are troublesome times in which we live, aren't they? <laughs> But ladies, we must be on guard as we see the day approaching. Be on the alert. Don't give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. But do what Paul will mention in a few verses here in Timothy. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will both save yourself <laughs> and those who hear you. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do ask that you would help us to be alert, be on the lookout, because Lord, there's always a new seducing spirit and a doctrine of a demon that's trying to enter into our church and trying to steal away the flock. I pray that we would be wise about these things. Lord, so many things, they tickle our ears, they sound good. And I pray that we as women would be wise that we would be wise, especially regarding these two specific things, marriage and foods. I pray that we would get back to the biblical reason for marriage. I pray that we would not buy in, even into the Christian world, of what they are saying that our marriage should be and what it should look like. Lord, help us to be good students of your word and help us to know about what it is that you say that marriage is a companion of two people coming together for the glory of God. Help us to be wise in our roles as husband and wife. And then, Lord, regarding food, I pray that many of us, I know, have made these things a spiritual issue. Many of us have pushed our ideas on others to the point of being offensive. And I pray, God, that we would realize that these things are good. You created them. And they're to be received with thanksgiving because you've created them and pronounced them good. So, Lord, help us to be wise in these days and help us to be discerning. Uh, pray this for these ladies this evening that you would give them rest and give them a time of refreshment. I pray that they would come back tomorrow with uh, zeal and joy and be able to think on these things that we've studied tonight. And I pray these things in Christ's name, my Savior. Amen. Amen.